Hi, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and that means it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show, brought to you by Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M. Check it out. This is the teaching company's uh, new name for their subscription service in which they stream their thousands of courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travel logs, documentary shorts, long-form documentary films, and of course, my favorite, their actual long courses, 24 lectures, 36 lectures, 48 lectures by professional, uh, well, by professors uh, and produced in a professional studio. So the sound quality is great. The visuals are great. If you enjoy watching lectures, I like to listen to them. I've got the earbud in wherever I'm going. I'm riding my bike, driving in the car, walking the dog, going uh, shopping at the store, whatever. I'm listening to a course. It's fabulous. So check them out. If you do so, you get two years for the price of one through this show. So go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash Shermer. You get two years for the price of one. I'll just stop right there. Just go do it right now. Just click pause, pause, and then you click over. Okay, you're back. Good. You subscribed, two years for the price of one. Good. Let me tell you about this course here. I haven't listened to this one yet. It's 12 lectures. It's uh, called The Great Debate. Advocates and opponents of the American Constitution. There were opponents to the American Constitution? Yeah, not the English. I mean, Americans were opposed to it. Who are these people? Well, you have to find out. The significance and historical context of this debate. Classical Republicanism, the anti-federalists' Republican vision. There's your answer to who uh, this was. The argument over national security. Deep difficulties in each position. Debating the meaning of federalism. Listening to the Federalist Papers, they're fantastic. Well, they're fantastic. They're written in that long uh, form, 19th century style of writing, but there's, it's just fabulous. Uh, the Madison Republic, the argument over representation, separation of powers, part one and part two. That's two full lectures because that is the key to our country's Supreme Court and judicial review. And finally, number 12, the Bill of Rights. All this is still relevant today in 2023, even though these guys drafted this so long ago. Anyway, that's just my favorite course here for this week. Check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. Get two years for the price of one. Start with that course or any of these others I've talked about on the show because I love this company so much, and I thank them for their support of this show. All right, here's our next episode. This is brought to you by, as usual, the Skeptic Society, which publishes Skeptic Magazine, which you can pick up at your local bookstores, Barnes & Noble, or any of your independent stores or chains, or you can go to skeptic.com slash magazine and order it there. We're also in, not only in print, but also digital, so you can read it on your phone or your smartphone, your laptop or your iPad or wherever you read your content. You can also support the show and our work at skeptic.com slash donate if you want to make a donation. Skeptic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit education organization out there protecting you from crazy bad ideas. <laughs> My guest today is Dr. Michio Kaku, the co-founder of String Field Theory, and he is the Henry Samat Professor in Theoretical Physics at the City University of New York. He graduated with a BA from Harvard and a PhD in Physics from the University of California at Berkeley. He has hosted several TV specials for the BBC TV, the Discovery Channel, and the Science Channel. You know, you've seen him a lot. He hosts two national science radio shows, Exploration and Science Fantastic, a show I've been on a bunch of times. He's the author of numerous New York Times bestselling books, including The God Equation. Oh, you were on for, uh, you were on this show for that. Uh, so you're our returning champion, uh, Michio. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> also, The Future of the Mind, The Future of Humanity, Physics of the Future, Hyperspace, Parallel Worlds, Physics of the Impossible, and Beyond Einstein. Here's the new book, Quantum Supremacy, How the Quantum Computer Revolution Will Change Everything. I, I listened to the whole thing in audio, Michio. It was great. Mm -hmm. This is, It's really good. So the first thing I want to ask you is, how is it you're able to do theoretical physics and be a full-time professor and write all these fantastic books? How do you do that? Well, first of all, I'm proud to say that uh, there's a lot of interest in the fact that the computer industry is in turmoil. The book, Quantum Supremacy, just hit the New York Times bestseller list. Really? Congratulations. Yeah. So it's now nice. officially a bestseller. All right. Yeah. And just remember that, uh, well, you know, every physicist has a hobby. Uh, believe mm. it or not, a lot of string theorists like to go hiking. I prefer <laughs> not to go hiking. <laughs> I That's prefer funny. to talk, to talk to people and write books. This is what I do for a hobby. And it's, of course, educational, because I want people to share the same enthusiasm 
and the same vitality with which I approach science. And I think it's infectious that if you say that you're interested in physics and then you explain many of the wonders of the universe through physics, people get hooked. And that's why I do it. Interesting. And just curious as a fellow author, how, how do you work? Do you set aside like a block of three hours a day to write or do you just do it catch, catch as catch can? Well, it's a hobby. So what I do is I scan the internet. I look for the latest developments in space travel and astronomy and biology and genetics. And uh, then once in a while, an idea come, pops in my head. And I say, oh, Jack can write a book about that. <laughs> and so then I just, you know, look around the internet and writing books is much easier than the old days. The old days I had to go to the New York Public Library. It was a hassle. You wasted the whole day trying to ne negotiate through the labyrinth of the New York Public Library. Now, with the push of a button, you can write a book. Yes, well, let me ask you this uh, to that extent then. Chat GPT or GPT-4, 4.5, whatever. Would you continue writing your books or are you going to basically hire it done by an AI? Well, let's look <laughs> at what uh, chat uh, bots do. They are tape recorders. What they do is they grab different aspects of a certain topic on the internet, splice it together, and put it and pass it off as if it's created by them. Now, it sounds eerie. It sounds as if a human wrote these things, and that's precisely right. A human did write these things. All the robot did was plagiarize, and uh, it's like a tape recorder that simply takes existing sound and puts it together. And so there's no originality. Right from wrong is there's no understanding of right from wrong, truth and falsehood. It's a tape recorder. And that's why I think there's plenty of room for writers who are creative and can go beyond simply parroting what other people have said. Yeah, you know, there was this statement signed by thousands of people to put a six month pause on uh, on all uh, GPT type AI programs. And some of the people that signed it were, you know, authors of books like kind you write and i and so i tweeted at them no one responded but you know are you gonna quit writing books i mean aren't you don't you want to write your own stuff who would use that you know to completely replace themselves maybe you'd use it for research or something like that but i just can't imagine somebody not wanting to write uh, and, and just hiring a chat gpt to do the work for them well you know the new york post had a big article they quoted certain passages from a chatbot saying that the robots are going to take over Humans will be irrelevant. Uh, welcome the reign of robots. And there's a chatbot saying these things. What <laughs> happened, of course, was some teenage boy was ranting and raving on the computer. And look, all the chatbot does is it takes bits and pieces of different statements and splices them together. So you got to watch out. You, you can unconsciously promote all sorts of nonsense and all sorts of different kinds of dishonesty if you don't watch out. So it's better to write it yourself rather than relying upon a chatbot. Yeah. Do you have any concerns that uh, advanced AI could lead to the extinction of the species or the collapse of civilization or even something like mass unemployment or some, some big catastrophic threat to our well, lives? Well, I think unemployment will change. But then again, take a look at it this way. We don't have blacksmiths anymore, but we don't cry about the fact that we don't have blacksmiths anymore because they became automobile workers and other kinds of workers. And in the same way, a carpenter is not replaced by a hammer. A hammer does not replace a carpenter. A hammer increases the power of a carpenter. So I think that in the future, the people who will lose jobs are those that are purists who want to do everything by hand and shun any kind of computer-aided work. And the people who will thrive in the future are the people that understand the limitations of this technology and use it. And remember, you got to be careful when you use this technology. Uh, you cannot yell fire in the middle of a crowded theater. That's against the law. And so we have a situation where we have freedom of speech within limits. And so you have to be careful that your chatbot doesn't run away and declare war and do all sorts of nonsense in your name. And that's the problem that we have to negotiate. Well, that's the only scenario that I've heard that, that could possibly lead to something like a, a catastrophe where some uh, AI creates a, uh, a, a deep fake video of President Biden ordering his cabinet to, or the Pentagon to launch first strike missiles against the Soviet Union, sorry, Russia, 
and then they strike back and we have nuclear war when actually nobody wanted that except some teenager with a with an AI. What what could we do to prevent something like that? I think there has to be a fact checker. Uh, take a look at media. When you see a movie, at the end of the movie, there's a disclaimer saying that this movie was fake. All the <laughs> actors are fake. This movie from start to finish is fake. Movies have that. And comic books, I remember when I was a kid, comic books would have a lot of monster stories that, uh, that outraged parents. Parents complained to Congress. Congress forced the comic industry to rein in some of the horrible stories it was printing. And today there's a comic code. That is, the comics are self-regulated. Movies are self-regulated. Rather than having the heavy hand of some bureaucrat try to ride this issue onto a re-election, uh, we're talking about the fact that the industry has to police itself to make sure that the politicians don't police it and ruin everything. Yeah, I'm fond of saying, because uh, I have a Tesla, that uh, if I instructed it, you know, please navigate to LAX in the fastest possible route, and it took me up on sidewalks to b mow down pedestrians, it would be, you know, a New York minute before the regulatory state jumped all over Tesla and stopped the production, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So technology is a double-edged sword. Any technology is like that. One side cuts against ignorance, poverty, disease, and riches society, but the other side of the sword can cut against people. And so this is a very powerful technology. You know, it, it's, if some a teenager impersonates Vladimir Putin and declares war on NATO, uh, we're in big trouble. And so we have to make sure that it is self-regulated. And that's where quantum computers come in. Well, I talked to several computer scientists, and they say that a lot of the computers are not up to speed. That is fact-checking such a volume of statements being put on chatbots is beyond the capability. And so we need a new generation of computers, quantum computers, that would help to regulate some of the nonsense that goes on the internet. So fact-checking, I think, is the way to go. Yeah, I agree. Okay, quantum computing. Let's, let's back up a little bit. Uh, Feynman famously said, no one understands quantum physics. Okay, if Feynman says that, then what hope is there for me? None. <laughs> so kind of walk us through what is quantum physics and, and what would a quantum computer be like and how would it differ from the things sitting in front of me here? Well, think of an ordinary computer. It computes in binary. Uh, think of a spinning top, for example. I think if you think about it, it can spin this way, but imagine for the moment it could also spin this way. And so a spinning top would have two modes, up and down, which can be related to zeros and one. And that's it. That's all that we have with computer power. Now imagine that this thing can rotate and rotate at any angle simultaneously. How much more powerful is that? How many more states do we have to integrate over? Infinite number. We have infinite number of states that the top can orient itself, surpassing the power of any digital computer, which computes on zeros and ones, zeros and one. And about two years ago, there was a race and the, the quantum computer in China and also at Google met the challenge. They beat a standard supercomputer at a certain select uh, question. So in other words, we have already achieved quantum supremacy. That is, quantum computers on select problems can exceed the capability of any digital computer. Wow. Okay. So it's not just a couple of order magnitude faster or, or better than a current computer. It's essentially infinitely more powerful. That's right. And just remember that there's a race, a race. The Chinese are backing what are called optical quantum computers, computing on light beams. In the United States, we use electrons, uh, Google, IBM. They're computing on electrons in order to do these calculations. And the world economy, the world economy could eventually be determined by which nation, which company is first to market a, reuse, a usable quantum computer. So there's a lot at stake. Meanwhile, Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. You realize that computers are getting, uh, transistors are getting tinier and tinier. At Christmas time, this means that your toys are twice as powerful as the previous Christmas. 
That cannot be sustained. Transistors today are maybe maybe 20 atoms across, approximately. In a few more years, it'll be there'll be five atoms across. At that point, you get leakage, the electron wave falls apart, and you get a short circuit. So in other words, Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. Well, so where would it be? Or maybe you don't have to have a, a, an industrial center like that anymore. Well, what's going to replace it is quantum computers. And guess what? Guess who's leading the pack? They all have groups studying quantum computers. Microsoft, uh, Honeywell, uh, IBM, uh, Google, all of them have quantum computers prototypes that they're developing. In fact, in two weeks, I'm flying to Santa Barbara, compliments of 60 minutes, and we'll be taping, taping with the quantum computer made by Google. Now, remember that these quantum computers are not ready for prime time. They are being sold, but in a limited capacity. The full-blown quantum computer that can outrace any known computer and perform incredible calculations, that is still maybe 10 or so years away. Mm. Well, I'm here in Santa Barbara, Michio, so let me know when you're, when you're here so we can, we can visit. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not far from that, com that, that Google computer. Yeah, I'd heard about that here. How is it that, is it, is it, let me, let me rephrase that. You know, I've been hearing these stories about AI and, and it's going to achieve human level consciousness. You know, we're five years away and then the joke is, you know, and, and, and always will be. Uh, I remember when Eric Drexler's book came out, you know, about based on Feynman's, you know, there's plenty of room at the bottom paper and how we were going to have these little nanobots that can, you can inject into your body and it cleans up cancer cells and things like that. But that hasn't happened. Is it just because it's a really hard problem and that, say, computer quantum computing will happen, but it's not five years away, it's 50 years away? And, you know, how do you, you know, deal with those kinds of almost sci-fi projections? Well, computing with atoms is really hard. If somebody uh, slips on the floor, burps, coughs, uh, you, the vibrations from that cough could ruin the whole calculation that you're doing on a quantum computer. How do you get around that? We use liquid helium to bring the temperature down to near absolute zero. So there's mo no motion at all, hardly at absolute zero. So what does it look like? A quantum computer looks like a chandelier, a huge chandelier, most of them containing pipes containing liquid helium and other kinds of, of uh, cold liquids. So it takes time to build these things. Now the Chinese are using optical computers and so they don't have to bring it all the way down to near absolute zero. But you see what the problem is. Now, Mother Nature has quantum computers that compute at room temperature. If you don't believe me, go outside. See the flowers, see the leaves. They're all doing quantum mechanical calculations at room temperature. So we know it's possible. But right now, we're still using liquid helium and different kinds of coolants to do these calculations. So you're right, it'll take a while before we work out the details. Is there any concern about somebody getting a monopoly on this kind of technology? Or are you comforted by the fact that there's so much competition that nobody could actually control it? Well, it's like a horse race. Each horse has a different mode of operation. The Chinese, as I said, use light beams. Um, IBM, Google, they use electricity. Um, Different companies use different modes because, of course, they're all quantum mechanical. There are many, many quantum mechanical devices that Mother Nature has perfected over the eons. And so we're in a situation where it's a horse race. But just remember that the nation or the company that wins the horse race could control a good chunk of the world economy. That's what's at stake, the world economy. And guess who's interested in this? The CIA. Mm. The CIA and the FBI documents leaked out from the CIA show clearly that they're monitoring the situation very carefully. And NIST, the government that controls standards, like the old National Bureau of Standards, they e even issued a directive saying that quantum computers are not here yet, but you gotta be prepared. Because when they do arrive, they can crack any known digital code. The crown jewels, the crown jewels of the CIA are up for grabs once a quantum computer is up and running. So you see what the stakes are, awfully high stakes. 
So the idea of a six-month pause on artificial intelligence is pretty ridiculous because none of the countries working on this are going to pause and none of the companies that are in a race are going to pause. So who's, who is it that's supposed to pause? Yeah, it's going to be a problem. Um, however, look at comic books, look at movies, look at a lot of things where copyrights are you know, kind of vague. Uh, they are policed internally. And so it is possible, but like I said, uh, it's, we have a ways to go before we get a uniform code for the whole industry. But every technology has a good side and a bad side. Every technology without exception, including these technologies and AI. So I think at some point, AI has to be self-regulated or else the government will regulate it for you. Mm -hmm. On the physics of all this, is, is it, because I don't really understand it, um, is it possible to have multiple kinds of quantum computers such that there's not one technology that anybody could have a monopoly on because there's different forms of it? That's right. If you take a look at the variety of things around you, it's all quantum. Uh, nature does not use zeros and ones, zeros and one binary. Nature is strictly quantum mechanical. And there are many ways in which you can carry out a quantum mechanical calculation. And so it's a horse race, but each horse is backing a slightly different version of quantum mechanics. And the creepy thing about this is that each one of these modes is computing in a parallel universe. Now, this means that electrons can be more than one position at any given time. Now, ever since you were a child, your parents told you you cannot be two places at the same time. Well, they lied to you. It turns out that in the quantum world, electrons are always many places at the same time. That's just the name of the game. In other words, why are quantum computers so powerful? Because they compute on parallel universes. And how many parallel universes are there? Infinite. So Hollywood got it almost right. Uh, all the Oscars were swept up by the multiverse. But hey, what can I say? Uh, the multiverse is the arena in which quantum computers operate. And then the next question I often get is, is Elvis Presley still alive in a parallel universe? And the answer is, well, probably yes. There probably is a parallel universe someplace where the king is still belting out songs. Well, but it wouldn't be him exactly, right? It'd be a slightly different version. It would be a different version than our version Elvis, of Elvis Presley. Maybe, it, maybe he'd be blonde instead of uh, brunette or something. <laughs> That's possible. You go crazy thinking about this. You know, when I look in a mirror, I realize that I'm not really seeing myself as I really am. I'm seeing myself, first of all, a billionth of a second ago, because that's what it takes for light to go from my face to the mirror to my eyes, about a billionth of a second. But there are infinite versions of me, some of which go outside, some of which go to the kitchen, some of which go into a car or the subway system. And here I am thinking that I'm the only game in town, that I'm the only me. I think we have to revise the word me. What does me mean if you can have parallel universes? Well, but these are all at quantum level effects, not at right. the macro level where we live, right? I mean, <clears throat> whether the moon exists or not, I mean, is, is not an appropriate question for the macro level. It, it's there whether I look at it or not, but that's different at the quantum level where the observation does make a difference. Well, I asked Steve Weinberg, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, yeah. about this question, and he gave the following analogy. Think of yourself in your living room listening to the radio. How many frequencies are there in your living room? Hundreds of different kinds of radio frequencies are there, but your radio has decohered from the other frequencies, only vibrates in unison with the radio station that you're listening to. Now, replace all the radio waves with electron waves, all the possible orientation of electrons. So in your living room, there are, in principle, the electrons of dinosaurs, pirates, aliens from outer space, asteroids from outer space. All these wave functions are there in your living room, but you have decohered from them. You no longer vibrate in unison with them. So in other words, for all intents and purposes, you can't visit Elvis Presley. It means, of course, it's theoretically possible, but it's not practical. 
So for our PhD students, we sometimes give them the problem, calculate the probability that you'll wake up on Mars. Now, when you do the calculation, you find out that you have to wait longer than the lifetime of the universe for that to happen, but it's not zero. So in principle, it may be possible to wake up on Mars. However, I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah, so here, you know, you look in the mirror, who are you looking at? What is the self? You know, you have this chapter on immortality and that quantum computers could help us achieve that. I don't think so for this reason. Uh, I define the self as the, your point of view self, you looking through your eyes, experiencing life from moment to moment to moment. There is a break when you go to sleep and you wake up or general anesthesia, you wake up. But after death, it, the process is over. It's gone. A digital copy of you is just that. It's just a copy. It, you're not having, you're not experiencing anything. You're gone. And so your relatives that are, say, having a conversation with digital Michio Kaku, because we've uploaded all the uh, lectures you've ever given and every audio book you've read and everything about you, and your relatives could have a relatively thoughtful conversation with you, but you're not conversing with anybody. It's just the digital copy of you. So that's not you. I agree. I mean, that's like a, a question of a digital copy, but a quantum copy, a quantum copy would be more or less identical to you. The memories, the personality quirks, uh, the, the figures of speech, uh, they would all be identical to you. And you would exist in parallel universes, but you cannot enter them because we're very big. We consist of what, 10 to the 26 atoms approximately. That's a lot, that's a lot of electrons. And so we cannot freely move between these universes, like in the Hollywood movies, which won all the Oscars uh, this year. Uh, however, theoretically, it's possible. And at the atomic level, electrons do it all the time. It's called lasers. It's called GPS. All the wonders of electronic technology are due to the fact that electrons can be two places at the same time. Now, if you don't like it, get used to it. That's just the way it is. <laughs> okay, I understand. Uh, 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 but could you explain a little bit more what decoherence means? Well, everything is made out of electrons and subatomic particles, and they vibrate. They vibrate at a certain frequency. When something vibrates in unison with that frequency, then you can make a transition between these objects. So in principle, if there was a parallel universe right next to you, which was vibrating in unison with your parallel universe, then you can move between these universes. Now, in practice, of course, you get decoherence. Something that is in phase eventually falls out of phase, and you can no longer make the transition between these universes. But lasers do it all the time. And that's why we call them lasers. They are coherent. They vibrate in unison with each other. So in other words, to go to a parallel universe, you would have to vibrate at the same frequency as that universe. And that is extremely hard to do, except at the atomic level, where electrons do it all the time. And it's called electronics. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, by the way, uh, on quantum computers at that very low temperature, so at, at, at close to zero, there's no molecular activity, right? So like with cry when I read about cryonics, how does this prevent you from decaying? Because the molecules have stopped. But the atoms don't stop whatever they're doing, jiggling or whatever atoms do. Uh, yeah, uh, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you cannot reach absolute zero. Absolute zero is not attainable according to the first law of thermodynamics. You can get close. You can cl get close uh, to within one h-bar of zero, but you can never reach absolute zero. So how does Mother Nature do all these quantum mechanical calculations? Everything you see around you, you know, medicine, plants, food, uh, the universe, it's all quantum mechanical. These quantum mechanical things, many of them operate at room temperature. We can't do that yet because nature is very fast. Nature is so fast with these chemical processes that atoms don't have time to move and become decoherent. And so that's why we have photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is made possible as a quantum effect. And this is the practical application of quantum computers, medicine. It turns out that all medicine is at the molecular level. 
cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. Why are these diseases incurable? Because how do we create wonder drugs? We take thousands of petri dishes, put a little bit of poison or uh, these bacteria in these petri dishes, hit it with different chemicals by the thousands, and then cross your fingers. That's how we make wonder drugs. That's why it costs a billion dollars to make one wonder drug. Mother Nature does it for free. We have to learn from Mother Nature, and that's where quantum computers are coming in. Quantum computers, we think, can create quantum medicine. That is to create, for example, the disease uh, called Alzheimer's is the disease of the century. Now we realize that looking at the molecular structure of the amyloid protein, there are at least two kinds of amyloid proteins. One twists clockwise, and the other twists counterclockwise. And only the right twist causes Alzheimer's disease, the left twist does not. Which means that if a quantum computer can separate the left and the right versions, we may have a potential cure for Alzheimer's disease. So diseases operate at the molecular level. Our computers operate at the zeros and ones, zeros and one level. We're way behind Mother Nature. And that's where quantum computers can come in. Yeah, that was a thoughtful personal story you told about your mother in the book. And uh, yeah, we baby boomers are going to be experiencing that soon. So I hope this quantum revolution happens <laughs> much sooner than the 20 years away and always will be kind of a uh, meme about that. Um, so the problem that you're describing here is that these are hard problems to solve, like the problem of consciousness, so-called hard problem of consciousness. In what way do you think consciousness could be quantum? Uh, you know, there are theories about this, quantum consciousness. That they haven't panned out very well, maybe because we don't have quantum computers to simulate it. Well, personally, I, I don't think you need to invoke all of quantum mechanics to get quantum consciousness. I think, I think for example, that there's a continuum of consciousness. I say that one unit of consciousness is one feedback loop that understands where you are in the environment, like a flower. I say that a flower is conscious. A flower has maybe two or three units of consciousness to detect carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. So a flower has an intelligence of three units. Then we have an alligator. An alligator understands space. It has a, a unit of maybe a few hundred, a few hundred feedback loops that allow the alligator to understand where it's located in three dimensions. Beyond that, we have the monkey. The monkey has social consciousness. It knows the hierarchy of who's the boss in the tribe, who is my friend, who can I gang up with, so on and so forth. That's social consciousness. And then the question is, where do we fit in this thing? Do we have spatial consciousness? Do we have social consciousness? What kind of consciousness that separates us from the animals. I say we have time travel, that our brain is a time machine. It constantly runs simulations of the future. What do you do when you daydream? What do you do when you think about the future? Let's do an experiment. Talk to your dog tonight and teach your dog the meaning of tomorrow. I've tried. <laughs> you can't. You can't teach your dog the meaning of tomorrow because their brain does not have the prefrontal lobe. Our brain's prefrontal road lobe is a time machine. That's all it does. It looks at different scenarios of the future. So I think that intelligence is the ability to simulate many, many uh, roads to the future. And someone who is not so intelligent only can see the future in a very, very crude way. A safe cracker, a master criminal, they can see way into the future because they can simulate simulate human behavior, and simulate the future. So I think the key to consciousness is that we have a time machine and animals don't. Otherwise, we're both conscious. I say a flower is even conscious. Uh, you know, two or three units of consciousness. We have maybe a few thousand units of consciousness as we simulate the future. That's my theory. I like that. I like that a lot. What about panpsychism? You know, this glass of water has some consciousness, although it's very limited. I, to me, that feels like it's going too far. I can see your, you know, the flower has three degrees of 
Yeah, whatever. feedback loops. How many feedback loops does that glass of water have? Zero. Yeah. And the smallest number of feedback loops would be in a plant that has maybe three, let's say, three units of feedback loops. And uh, then you go up the scale. You can give a number, a number of how conscious an animal is by calculating how many feedback loops it has in order to create a picture, a model of itself. In this, in this smooth spectrum up the scale, is there a quantum, so to speak, leap, or just make a, a giant leap, uh, let's say from chimps to humans, in which there's something more than a quantitative difference, there's a qualitative difference in sentience? I don't think so. I don't think it's that big because even chimpanzees uh, daydream to a degree. It's not much, but they do look into the future. They do plan. And uh, that, I think, is the hallmark of our intelligence. Our intelligence is temporal, temporal intelligence. Um, I think that alligators have spatial intelligence. I think monkeys have social intelligence, but we have temporal intelligence. And that's what separates us from them. Now, when we meet aliens from out of space, it's often said that they're going to be more intelligent than us. Now, what does that mean? I think it means that they see the future much clearer than us. They have a better understanding of the laws of nature, and therefore they're able to run the videotape, run the videotape into the future much more accurately than us. So I think that if we meet aliens who are smarter than us, what does that mean to be smarter than us? It means that they see the future much clearer than we see the future. You know, mm, the Air Force... Yeah. Go ahead. The Air Force did a study. Uh, they took a bunch of uh, GIs and they asked them, if you're shot down over enemy territory in Vietnam, uh, how do you escape? And it turns out that the soldiers that had high IQs were kind of ordinary in terms of seeing different ways of escaping. But there were some people who had very low IQ that were masters of this. They could dream up all sorts of different kinds of schemes by which they can escape. And then they realized that, well, what does it mean? The common denominator of the people who were, quote, smart was they saw the future. But there's different ways to see the future. The people who are book smart that, that do well on an IQ exam failed miserably to escape from a jail in North Vietnam. So I think it means that we have to be careful that there are different kinds of seeing the future. A master criminal may see the future much clearer than the police and evade the police as a consequence because a master criminal can see different scenarios, different ways in which the future unravels for them. And that's why they are master criminals while, while the police are just left in the dust. Well, you're talking about creativity really there then. Uh, creativity, yeah. Being able to see the future and using the tools, using the tools at their disposal, like knowing a little bit about escape routes, knowing a little bit about firearms and stuff like that. Well, well I think where that, like, like, like banks hire, you know, uh, criminals or, who have conned the banks themselves because they know how to think around the problems that the bank uh, uh, tech people can't think of. Right. So I think yeah, that that the common denominator is that intelligence is having a time machine in your head, but there's different kinds of time machines. Running the videotape forward, there are different ways of doing it, legally and illegally, for example. Hmm. Yeah, intelligence is usually defined as problem solving. You know, smarter people are better at solving problems. I guess that would be a subset of your time dimensionality. That's right. Yeah, seeing the future, to me, is the essence of intelligence. You know, Michio, I can't remember if you're a determinist or a compatibilist or a libertarian free willist or where you stand on that. Uh, and, and where does where if you believe in some kind of volition, does it come out of this ability to see the future and alter it? Well, I like to think of the way Einstein looked at things. Um, for example, he would often be asked, is there a God? OK. And what, it, what does it mean to to fathom the nature of the universe. And so he said that, well, there are two kinds of God. There's the God that intervenes in human affairs. He didn't think that that God was real, but he believed in the God of order, the, the God of Spinoza, that the universe could not have been an accident, that it's simply too ordered. It's too 
well put together to have just been a random fluctuation. Now, most physicists would probably believe that the universe is a quantum fluctuation. We started off with nothing, but even nothing's unstable under the, under the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, so there are fluctuations. These fluctuations call, cause bubbles, and so we have lots of bubbles percolating in the vacuum. One day, one of these bubbles kept on going, and that became our universe. So our universe is nothing but one bubble that did not pop back into nothingness, but just kept on going as an accident. And so anyway, the point here is that the fact that the universe is so gorgeous, so ordered, he thought meant something, that there was a, um, a higher order to things, that it could have been random. We could have been a, an ocean of electrons and neutrinos. That's the lowest state of subatomic particles. It could have been just an ocean of, of electrons and neutrinos. But here we are talking about this. And of course, there are many ways in which you can interpret that. So like Laplace, you have no need of that hypothesis for, that is God. Well, there could be a God or maybe not a God. The point is that um, physics is based on what is testable, reproducible, and falsifiable. That's science. And the concept of God is beyond that. It's beyond what is testable, falsifiable, and reproducible. Well, well then why should we believe it or not? On what basis? Uh, well, it's a personal choice, I think, at that point, uh, because of the fact that it is outside of science. If science is the set of things that are testable, blah, 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 then things that are outside of that are outside of science. So I think the question of God is beyond science, because it depends on faith. It depends upon believing in things that cannot be measured. And that means, by definition, beyond science. Yeah, but, okay, so, but knowledge is justified true belief. I, I, I don't want to believe things that have to be believed in to be true. I want to believe things that are actually true. So what's the justification? And if you just say there's no justification, you just believe it or not, well, okay, but, but which God? you know, or which religion or what, whatever ideology or whatever, there has to be some way to justify the belief or else why bother? That's, that's Oh, well, just because a human cannot justify a belief one way or the other doesn't mean it's true or false. It just means that certain things are not testable. And as a consequence, uh, science says nothing, nothing one way yeah. or the other, because yeah. it's not a testable, it's not a testable hypothesis. So when people ask you, are you an atheist or agnostic or theist, what do you say? What are I you? I say I'm an agnostic. Okay, Einstein thought that the universe was so gorgeous, he considered himself to be a child entering this huge library for the first time. This huge library, and all he could do was take the first book, take the first book out and read a few pages of the first book. All the secrets of the universe was in front of him. So I think that, yeah, I think that people can pontificate about these things, but there's nothing definite. Science likes to deal with things that are testable so that you can say conclusively it's this rather than that. This is beyond science. You know, um, Arthur C. Clarke's third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So I wrote one of my Scientific American columns uh, about God, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence or super far advanced human AI, whatever, would be indistinguishable from God. That is to say, let's run your quantum computer experiment. Essentially, it would be omniscient and omnipotent once it has the technology and engineering to manipulate uh, uh, matter. We, it, it, if it could create life, if it could create DNA, self-replicating molecules, it could, complete, it could, could compute uh, consciousness, it could create out of black holes maybe new universes, and so on, uh, isn't that God? Well, there's a joke that one day in the future we create a supercomputer and we ask the question, is there a God? And the supercomputer says, there is now. <laughs> right. Well, but yeah. That would, in, in a way, I, I guess what I'm asking is, how would it be testable? Because if your far future that you write about turns out to be true, it would be what most people think of as an omniscient, omnipotent being. That's what you mean by God. And, and so is, oh, there it is. <laughs> well, believe it or not, uh, some of my friends who are also theoretical physicists have conjectured what, it would, what would it be like to be a god, that one day we might be able to become a god. You see, our so-called laws of physics break down at the Planck energy. 
that's 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. At that point, all the laws of the quantum theory and relativity collapse at the Planck energy, which means that if you have empty space, just empty space and boil it, that is heated to trillions and trillions of degrees, at some point it begins to boil, just like water. Empty space will begin to boil. Boiling of little bubbles begin to form, and these bubbles are wormholes gateways to other universes, and for the most part, things pop into existence and pop back into existence, and that's boiling water. However, one of these bubbles just kept on going one day, and that became our universe. And then the question is, can we do that? Well, the short answer is no, but the long-term answer is, if we can control the Planck energy, if we can heat up empty space to 10 to the 19 billion electron volts, a quadrillion times more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider's energy, then we might be able to take one of these bubbles and let it expand to create a baby universe. And the baby universe would pop out into another dimension, so we would not see it happen, but it would, re it would bounce back, of course, onto our universe. And some physicists have done the calculation, and they show that it would be equivalent to a small kiloton nuclear weapon. So it'd be kind of dangerous to create a baby universe, but it's conceivable. And so believe it or not, we physicists have actually done the calculation of what it would take to become a god. <laughs> That's really funny. Well, because science is only a few centuries old and computer science is only maybe a century old. You know, if we encounter extraterrestrials, they're not going to be within uh, you know a, a time frame like that. They're going to, they'll either be way behind us, in which case we're unlikely to encounter them, or they're going to be way ahead of us by like millions of years. So if you take something like Moore's law, it won't apply to your quantum computers, but the idea of, you know, accelerating progress in any technology, you know, say 50,000 years worth of computer uh, advanced technology or a hundred thousand years or a million years, you know, you write about this in your books. Well, they should be able to do almost anything we can conceive of, which seems like a God. Well, we think that the Planck energy may be attained by what is called a type three civilization. Uh, we mentioned that before. A type one civilization is planetary, controls the weather, controls earthquakes and volcanoes. That's type one. Type two controls stars, like Star Trek. The nearby stars they control, that's Star Trek. Then there's type three, which is galactic. They roam the galactic space lanes like the empire of the Empire Strikes Back. And then you do a calculation. At what energy scale would it take to reach the Planck energy, or 10 to the 19 billion electron volts? And it would have to be type 3, which means you would be galactic, which means that you would be on the order of maybe a million years more advanced than us. And on that scale, some of their powers would, be, would, be, would look like godlike. I mean, if our ancestors years ago were to meet us today, they may consider us to be gods. So when we meet them, okay, and that is a type three civilization that could go across galaxies, then we would consider them to be gods, that they would be able to harness, well, quantum computers, for example. They would be able to manipulate molecules. They would be able to manipulate life. They would be able to manipulate things that we can only dream of today. And however, this, of course, is science fiction, but there's no law of physics that says you can't reach the Planck energy. Yeah, that's why I always apply in a Bayesian reasoning way what's called Cromwell's rule. Oliver Cromwell, who famously said, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, you might be mistaken. You know, never apply a zero or a, a 100 percent to anything because who knows? <laughs> so I don't want to be that guy that, you know, 500 years from now believes something ridiculously restricted here in 2023, when it turns out, you know, we just didn't know about X, whatever that is. Um, but still, you know, you have to assign some degrees of probability at the point you're, you know, trying to calculate what I should believe or justify what I should believe. By the way, um, we got distracted from the free will determinism because I don't know your position on that. It seems to me with the argument you're making for time, um, t time travel, <laughs> so to speak, that free will or something like volition or a compatibilist position that the conscious agent who's aware of the future 
and is relatively aware of the causal vectors flowing in to cause him to go left or right or whatever. Awareness of those and then altering the future. Like, okay, tomorrow I'm not going to do what I did today because I'm aware of the consequences of what I did. Therefore, I'm going to do something different tomorrow. This would require that the universe is not predetermined. So there's one question for you. And do you, do you agree with that kind of line of reasoning that something like volition can be derived from that? Well, uh, I think the world is not deterministic. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, earth, the world does not obey laws so rigidly that we are puppets, that we are puppets dancing to the tune of some puppet masters. And that would be like the Matrix, where you have a simulation that was programmed by somebody else, and we're simply carrying out, carrying out whatever the, the puppet master uh, deems necessary. I think that's incorrect because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In other words, if you want to simulate the weather, let's take a living room full of air molecules. And can our best computer simulate the weather inside your living room? And the answer is no. Our most advanced computer cannot calculate the trajectories of 10 to the what, 10 to the 25 atoms. In other words, the smallest thing that can simulate your living room is your living room. The smallest thing that can simulate the weather is the weather. Nothing smaller can do that. So I think that there's no matrix that allows us to be puppet masters by which we can deterministically calculate the future for the puppets that we control. So I think that it's probably not possible that we are living in the matrix. So if we re-ran the tape of life and played it again, not literally on a read-only memory tape, but just, just started it to run again, it's very unlikely you and I would be having this conversation or that something like Homo sapiens would evolve or whatever. You know, Stephen Jay Gould's famous thought experiment. There's too much contingency and randomness and chaos in the system. Right. That's right. So and, and with the uncertainty principle, it gets even worse because now we have infinite number of parallel universes that the universe may have gone into. And, um, and all these, these other universes probably do exist someplace. And so it gets even worse than that. So I think that we're not the only game in town. This is not the only universe. And that uh, maybe the Hollywood movies got it partially right in saying that there are an infinite number of possibilities that we exist in many different parallel universes. Mm. But there's different versions of that. The, uh, you know, multi, what is it? The many worlds hypothesis of that's different from the multiverse where there's different bubble universes Kind of walk us through some of the different scenarios for multiple universes. Well, it gets back to Schrodinger's cat where I have a cat in a box and the cat is connected to a gun. The gun could fire or not fire. So how do you describe a cat in a box? Uh, I teach this to my grad students. I tell my grad students that I write the wave function for a live cat and then add it to the wave function of a dead cat. At that point, there's always some kid who raises their hand and says, what? A dead cat and a live cat existing simultaneously? And I say, yeah, get used to it. This is just the way it is, folks. So you add the wave of a dead cat plus the wave of a live cat in a box. So is a cat really dead or alive? <laughs> You don't really know till you open the box, okay? So how do you interpret this philosophically? There are many ways of interpreting it philosophically. One is that the universe split in half. That in one universe, the cat is dead. In another universe, the cat is alive. The universe itself splits. The other possibility is that, well, you're not allowed to open the box. That's illegal. You cannot open the box. So get used to it. You were in Never Never Land where you're neither dead nor alive. Only when you open the box are you alive. And that's just the way it is. You are forbidden to open the box. Now, most people would say, that's stupid. Why can't you open the box? Well, when you open the box, you know whether the cat is dead or alive. You can't do that. That's not quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is you don't open the box, and then you don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. This is crazy stuff, okay? I mean, everything you know about reality that you cannot be two places at the same time. Everything you know about reality is called into question once you introduce quantum mechanics. And with quantum computers, it gets even worse because now you're computing. Now you're computing in these multiple universes. And so uh, what's the attitude of most physicists? Get used to it.
But, <clears throat> okay, I'm slightly confused. Uh, on the one hand, it sounds like you're skeptical of the matrix that we're living in a simulation. But on the other hand, if quantum computers are so sophisticated uh, and <clears throat> they created something like a holodeck, how would I know? Uh, well, if you take a look at how many states that you can compute, okay, uh, the states of an ordinary digital computer is up and down, up and down. So you can count. You can count how many states are in your living room, how many molecules there are, and immediately you realize that your computer on zeros and ones, zeros and ones, doesn't have enough states to catalog all the molecules in your room, okay? So now let's go to the quantum theory. In the quantum theory, each atom in your room can exist in multiple states, while your quantum computer only exists in a subset of those uh, uh, atoms. Your, your, your living room is much bigger than that. As a consequence, your quantum computer does not have enough states by which to count how many states there are in your living room. And so in other words, even a quantum computer cannot determine the future exactly. Mm. Yeah, I had David Chalmers on the show here last year. He wrote a whole book on the simulation hypothesis and so forth. But right at the beginning of the book, he says, none of this is testable. <laughs> it's like, well, then, okay, what is this? It's not really science, then. It's more like metaphysics or science fiction or something like that. I mean, if there's no way to know we're living in a simulation, although it seems to me, because he, he agreed that somewhere there has to be the hardware on which the computer, even a quantum computer, is running. Mm -hmm. So you you could have simulation upon simulation upon simulation, like that Star Trek episode, the next generation of the ship in a bottle, which is my one of my favorite episodes, where uh, uh, Mor Moriarty, Sherlock Holmes character, leaves the holodeck uh, with his sweetheart and and roams through the Enterprise and the and Picard and the crew are trying to figure out how did he leave the holodeck because that's not possible. And then we don't find out to the end that he, they never left the holodeck, that they're still in there and the holodeck is running the simulation of the enterprise. And then at the end, he wonders, well, maybe this whole thing is a simulation. He says, you know, computer end program and it doesn't. So, okay, this is the real one. But at some point there has to be a, a, a cube, right? A little box of a hardware computer that's running the simulation, no matter how many simulations of simulations there are. So you'd have to have some, you know, massive amount of computing power to do whatever it is you want to do. And you'd, you'd run up against some of the laws of physics then. Yeah, I agree. I mean, a quantum computer, no matter how powerful it is, simply mimics the behavior of molecules inside a small volume, while your living room is much bigger than that. And so even a quantum computer has limitations. Right. By the way, there's a little sidebar. Um, on the UAP UFO... Uh, subject, when you were talking about all the different companies and countries competing to develop quantum computers, nobody's very far ahead of anybody else. This reminds me of the arguments that UAPs may be super advanced drone technology or something that the Chinese have or the Russians have or some agency in the government that the other agencies don't know about. So, but that's just not how science and technology develops, right? Nobody gets very far ahead of anybody else because they copy each other, they steal each other's ideas, they spy on each other. You know, all, all, all the cell phone companies are pretty much the same. All computers are pretty much the same. No one's very far ahead of anybody else, and I don't think that's going to happen in AI either. So how is it possible that the Chinese or the Russians develop some kind of super anti-gravity technology to explain these grainy videos and blurry photographs of UAPs uh, as if they somehow are a century ahead of the United States government, the DARPA somehow missed all this? The CERN physicist didn't know about this new physics or something like that. That just seems improbable to me. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, however, the hypersonic drone that the Russians are using against the Ukrainians, uh, the Russians are more advanced than the United States, but not by much. Two years ago, the United States also had a hypersonic drone program, but they canceled it because the hypersonic drone was unstable. A hypersonic drone maneuvers, unlike most missiles. Most missiles just use Newton's laws of motion. But hypersonic drones, to evade a Star Wars program, have to be maneuverable, and they could very easily spiral out of control. And that's why the United States gave up on hypersonic drones two years ago. The Russians kept on going, and they're operational now. They're being used against the Ukrainians. So you're right that the edge that Russia now has on hypersonic drones is temporary. Because now the United States says, okay, okay, now we got to get in the game. 
And so the United States is going to be fielding hypersonic drones pretty soon. So you're right. One country does not get ahead of the other. Now, I tend to doubt that our technology was was savvy, uh, was uh, salvaged from a flying saucer that crashed on the planet Earth. Uh, if you were a scientist, you know the false leads in all the sweat and tears that went into creating the technology of today. But most people don't know that. And so they just see the technology when it's full-blown, fully mature, and they say, ah, the aliens did it. No, people did it. But it was hard work, years and years of pain and, and um, false steps to create this technology. It wasn't the aliens by, that gave it to us. Yeah, I always like those stories about Roswell that, that this happened right when transistors were being invented and, and that the, you know, the aliens crashed and they have integrated circuitry and we back engineered it from them as if we wouldn't have been able to figure out the transition from vacuum tubes to integrated circuits for computers, where you can actually see all of that in the invention uh, history of the computer. I like Matt Ridley's book on innovation. You know, there, there isn't a single innovation anywhere of anything that doesn't have predecessors to it. They all, everybody builds on everybody else. Right. However, if we do one day encounter an alien civilization, we shouldn't be surprised if their machines operate at the molecular level. In other words, we went through the Industrial Revolution where we had gigantic steam engines. Then we went through the Electric Revolution where we have electrical appliances. Then we went through trans the Computer Revolution with transistors, which are very tiny. Now we're talking molecules. We're talking about instruments at the molecular level, quantum computers. And that's the, that's the arena of Mother Nature. So we shouldn't be surprised if one day we do meet extraterrestrials that their technology is molecular based. Ours is not. Ours is based on zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Their technology, assuming they exist, would be, I think, molecular and maybe even atomic. Yeah, I always like your argument. It's about uh, that if we encounter ETIs, they're not likely to be biological. They're probably going to be some kind of computer. Yeah, um, if you think about it, um, in... On the planet Earth, uh, our robots could become sentient, who knows, maybe toward the end of the century. And at that point, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. <laughs> but beyond that, sooner or later, they'll figure out how to neutralize that chip in their brain. And at that point, they could be a real rival to humanity. My point, and I'm curious about your point, my point is that at that point, we should merge with them. That is, it's a losing proposition that sooner or later, they're going to be more advanced than us. Who knows when? We can argue about when that's going to happen. But when it does happen, why not merge with them? Why not become supermen and superwomen? Why not explore the galaxy with super advanced technology? Why not roam the, the world with avatars that can withstand gravitational pulls and toxic atmospheres? Why not? And I think that it's premature for us to say that it's impossible or immoral. I think the people of the future will democratically decide to do it on their own. They will vote democratically to whether or not to enhance themselves. Now, remember that we've been enhancing ourselves ever since we were cavemen and cavewomen with makeup and all sorts of tattoos. Uh, we've, been, we've been monkeying with our bodies since time immemorial to gain an evolutionary advantage. So I think that in the future, we may want to make the next jump. And that's perhaps transhumanism, which of course is not going to happen anytime soon, but it'll happen democratically. People will vote to decide how far to enhance themselves in the future. And again, this is not for us, but it's for our descendants who may want to explore the galaxy uh, as an enhanced individual. I'm 100% with you on that, Michio. I think, uh, you know, this idea of the precautionary principle, we better halt all development until we see what possible negative side effects there might be. No, just continue forward. And then if something really bad happens, then we can intervene. I never underestimate the power of the regulatory state to jump in and stop development. Uh, they can do that. But let's see if we can cure cancer first. I mean, I don't know why anybody would object to your your quantum computer idea. I mean, the idea, just going through some of the things in your book about, you know, feeding 10 billion people and energizing the world and 
health developments, ending cancer, gene editing, and so on. What's wrong with that? I mean, you know, the idea we should halt because something bad might happen. You mean you want to halt the development of, of like the ending of Alzheimer's? I mean, come on, go forward as fast as possible. I even like, uh, you know, Elon's MindLink. Is that the name of his company? MindLink, you know, putting chips in your brain. You have to be careful about that because you open up the head, open up the skull. That's very risky. Uh, but, you know, for like the um, cochlear implants, that's a, that's a kind of mind meld thing, right? And uh, I have two titanium hips and, you know, life is better for it. So just keep going. Yeah, I think that the digital era that we're in today will be eventually phased out. And what will replace digital is neural and quantum. So that is the language of Mother Nature. Mother Nature does not communicate with zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Mother Nature communicates with brain waves and also uh, at the molecular level, that is the quantum principle. That's the language of the universe. We are the exception dealing with binary. And so I think in the future, we will be able to access the human mind. And the human mind, of course, is neural, not digital and that we'll be able to replace the, the digital networks with quantum networks. And I think that's the flow. That's the flow of progress from digital to neural and quantum. All right, let's hit some of these uh, 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 areas in which quantum computing will change life. Uh, energy, um, nuclear, we got to have nuclear in the uh, equation somewhere. Uh, I think you agree. Well, last year the uh, at the... Um, Livermore National Laboratories in California, they attained break-even with fusion, getting as much energy out as they put in. And the Europeans are not too far behind. They have an advanced tokamak design uh, in uh, Kardashian, France, where they expect to get break-even. So the point is that uh, quantum computers can accelerate that process. Why did it take so long to create fusion power? because of instability in hydrogen gas. If I have a donut and I try to squeeze a donut, then it pops out in different angles. It's very difficult to squeeze a donut evenly. That's where quantum computers can come in because quantum computers can calculate the instabilities and perhaps correct for some of the instabilities so that we have a fusion era. And what's there not to love? Fusion is the language of the stars. Mother nature does not use uranium. Uranium is messy, creates waste, has meltdowns. Fusion has none of the above. And so I think that we're going to be entering a fusion era uh, where fusion power is commercially available, probably around 2030, 2040. In that time frame, I think we'll see some of the first uh, commercially available fusion reactors. And also with regards to solar power, uh, people predict that we should be in the solar age by now. We're not. What happened? What happened to the solar dream? People forget that the battery is the weak link in the whole chain. The battery does not obey Moore's law. It not, does not double in power every 18 months. As a consequence, we don't have a solar age. But if, super, if quantum computers can create a super battery to replace lithium batteries, then that would help to speed up the transition to the solar age because when the sun doesn't shine and the winds don't blow, you just lost a lot of money. And that's the problem with solar power. When the sun doesn't shine and the winds don't blow, you lose your shirt. And so quantum computers can help in that respect. And then, of course, food. If you think about food, uh, there's a process worked out by the, the Germans at the turn of the last century where we take nitrogen from the air and modify it to create ammonia, which is the ingredient for fertilizer. In your body, 50% of the molecules of your body are due to this artificial processing of fertilizer. That's how important the first green revolution is. But the first green revolution is now running its course. It's polluting, it's old fashioned. It uses up 1% of the energy of the planet Earth. That's huge energy consumption. So that's where quantum computers can come in because it's a quantum process, taking nitrogen, catalyzing it to become ammonia. That is a chemical process that a quantum computer might be able to satisfy. So for all these reasons, quantum computers can change everything. Do you think this could be Ray Kurzweil's singularity that he's been talking about since the 90s? 
Well, I think the singularity, you have to be careful. The exponential increase of computer power cannot go on forever. Uh, because of the fact that you're getting smaller and smaller, you're down to about you know, 20, 30 atoms now, approximately. And when you're down to five atoms, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle kicks in and your transistor short circuits, overheats, and there goes Moore's law. So these projections that by 2045, we would hit the singularity are based on assuming an exponential increase in computer power that's unabated. But that's not going to happen because of the fact that Moore's law will eventually collapse. So all bets are off when it comes to Moore's law of the future. Okay, you write about the world economy increasing dramatically because of quantum computing. Do you mean just because companies will be so uh, valuable in the products they're producing and so on that'll increase, which happens industrially? Or do you mean something more like cryptocurrency or, you know, this will give us some kind of new uh, financial system entirely different that we're not thinking of now? Well, the quantum computer could do the opposite for cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies depend upon codes, codes to predict the crown jewels that make the thing work. But that's exactly what quantum computers can do. They can break digital codes because they're not digital. They're quantum. And as a consequence... Uh, the CIA is very much interested in this. Some of the documents that leaked out from the CIA show that, yes, yes, they're looking into this. And NIST, uh, the government agency that, does, uh, that regulates the Bureau of Standards, they issued a directive stating that we're not there yet with quantum computers, but sooner or later it will happen. And at that point, all the codes could be broken into which means that now, now is the time to prepare for the future, <clears throat> for the future when quantum computers are powerful enough to break into any code. And so we're not there yet, but we're exponentially fast in terms of reaching that goal. I remember when the first quantum computer multiplied three times five is 15. That was earth shaking because that was done on atoms, <clears throat> but people laughed. People laughed. They said, what? All this hoopla around quantum computers and three times five is 15? Well, yeah, but now we can calculate on a thousand qubits, quantum bits, and we can do calculations in the billions and billions now. And so that's how fast the things are moving right now. And so the naysayers were left in the dust. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, although I'm I'm interested in uh, I mean I'm fond of asking people who uh, go on and on about AI as being sentient or whatever. You know, I'm a big Jeopardy fan, so I I remember when uh, IBM was Watson won Jeopardy against Ken Jennings, the great Ken Jennings and the other champions. And uh, but but does Watson know that it won? No, it doesn't even know it's playing Jeopardy. It doesn't even know what Jeopardy is. It doesn't know what a game is. It's just. It's just it's an, an adding machine. <laughs> yeah. We forget that these things are adding machines. They add millions of times faster than the brain. So we think they're conscious. But no, the bottom line is that they're adding machines. They don't have original thoughts. They can't, they're not creative. They can't plan for the future. They simply add. But they add very fast, giving the illusion that they're thinking. Now they can access the internet where other people have thought about these things and so it looks like they're thinking about these things. No, somebody else thought about those things. They simply homogenize it, cut it up, spliced it together, and then passed it off as if they thought of it. No, they didn't think of it at all. <laughs> Nicely put. All right, let's channel our inner Philip K. Dick minority report. You don't write about this in the book, but let, let's apply quantum computing to solving crimes, for example, how to reduce the amount of homicides or gun violence or suicides or whatever. Could you imagine a far future quantum computer that has enough input that it could predict who's going to commit a crime before they commit it and then, and then we go arrest them before they commit the crime or something like that? <laughs> I personally am skeptical. When I saw the movie, I said to myself, hmm, human behavior is quirky. Human behavior is not rational. If it were rational, then a computer could have an algorithm by which you can trace the steps by which a conclusion was, was made. But when it comes to murder, for example, or committing a crime, 
there's a lot of irrationality involved. You have a grudge against this person, for example, that could interfere with your uh, very uh, ice-like calculations about what it would take to kill somebody and get away with it. So I tend to doubt that we can predict human behavior uh, because, well, as you know, human behavior is quirky. In fact, I can't even predict my behavior sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I do things that I said to myself, what, I did that? That's really funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. All right, Michio, I know you got a hard out coming up and you've got a lot of uh, interviews lined up. Do you ever, you're 73 or four now, right? Something like that. And 76. 76. So you're, yeah, you're, you're almost a decade older than me. Ever wish you could live like another century just so you could see how all this plays out scientifically? In other words, you know, like in 2300, what are, what are scientists then going to be studying and think, oh, those people in 2023, I can't believe they believe that. You know, what, what, you know, are we approaching the end of science now or is there just so much more to discover and these quantum computers will open up a whole new world? Well, sometimes you get asked the question, if you could choose any century to be born, what century would you decide to be born in? Well, now. And if you think about it, <laughs> if, you way, if you go way in the past, there was so much hardship and, and crime and all sorts of problems, starvation. If you go too far in the future, then you're kind of like blasé. What? That's so old hat. <laughs> but if you're at the cusp, if you're at the cusp of the exponential rise in technology, then every day there's a new miracle happening. Every day there's a new breakthrough being made. And so I think this is a great time to be alive because we're at the cusp that just in the last century, think of what it was like in the last century with world wars, mass starvation, millions of people dying. And uh, we're at the cusp now of an exponentially rise in civilization. So I think this is a great time to be alive. Well, but wouldn't you love to come back and see that we're now a type two civilization or something like that, just to see what it's like? Yes, but I also realized that, you know, according to quantum mechanics, there are many, many paths to the future, not just one. So mm. if somebody shows me a path to the future where it's, things are bright, things are great, everything's hunky-dory, I realize there's another universe where war broke out, an epidemic broke out, many millions died, and they're equally probable. So I would say to myself that it's nice to imagine the future, but it's not deterministic. The future is yet to be written. The yeah. future is not created yet. Nice. And that we ha may have a role in creating that future. Mm -hmm, right. And that's why I think now is a great time to be alive, because you see all these marvelous things happening right before your eyes. It's incredible. You know, my attitude is the smallest unit of history is the decade. Anything smaller than a decade, you get random fluctuations. So you can't really make sense of things. History seems random. But then if you look at history decade by decade, then you realize, oh my God, tremendous progress every decade. Just for example, after World War II, you realize that hundreds of millions of humans went into the middle class. I mean, think about that. This is the greatest economic transition in the history of the earth when hundreds of millions of people in India and China went into the middle class. And so we're talking about tremendous changes decade by decade. And that's the smallest unit of history, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I like that. I remember that uh, in your book. And yeah, I agree. You know, it's like the UN's millennial goals. One of them is to end poverty, you know, which they define as making less than I think $2.50 a day or something like that. I think they projected by 2030, there'll be no more poverty in the world. Who could have imagined that ever happening? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, all the predictions of the past, sometimes we exceeded them. We went faster than some of the predictions of the past, right? Yeah, definitely. All right, Michio, here's the book again, Quantum Supremacy. It's a great read, big fun. Uh, lots of great uh, examples and stories in here. I really enjoyed the audio book. It's subtitled, How Quantum, The Quantum Computer Revolution Will Change Everything. Uh, what's your next book going to be? You probably haven't quite thought that through, but you're always thinking about future books to write. Yeah, no, I haven't decided yet. Okay. <laughs> I've written about so many things. I have to think, what haven't I re re written about? <laughs> Usually it's you take the last chapter and go, okay, that's the next book. <laughs> There's something in there, you know, <laughs> to kind of build on the path. You sort of, in your own innovation history, right? You kind of build on something else that you've done. Right. All right. right. 
Thanks, Michio. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your work in general. You're one of my favorite uh, science popularizers who's also a real scientist. And uh, oh, one last question on string theory. What is the status of string theory? You know, there's this idea it's not testable, so therefore it's not really science, or, but I don't know much about string theory. Well, I personally think that one day we're going to find dark matter and uh, there's lots of activity around it. And we find dark matter, we'll be able to calculate its properties. And string theory predicts, it predicts what dark matter should be like. And at that point, that's not going to prove it, but that'll go a long ways to quelling the, the critics of the theory. The theory is so advanced that experiment has not caught up to it. Therefore, it's, quote, untestable. But dark matter is something that is testable. In fact, there's dark matter in your room right now. We can't detect it with our instruments, but there's dark matter in your room. Once we find evidence for dark matter, that could clinch it because dark matter is predicted by string theory. It's a higher octave of the string, the Fotino. And so there it is. In the vibrations of the string, there's a particle that is invisible that should make up most of the universe. And that is dark matter. Nice. Right. Yeah. That's my explanation. answer to the pe people that say, you know, we're at the end of science. We've discovered it. Well, 95% of the universe is made of stuff, dark energy, dark matter. We don't know what it is. Well, okay. I don't think we're near the end. <laughs> no, I think we're at the beginning. We're at the beginning <laughs> yeah. of this.